fly anglers love to talk about their fly rods, and we really love to throw around fancy terminology while we do it. This fast action fly rod has a lot of feel to it, don't you agree with me, Gerard? Or, this fly rod was built with high modulus carbon fiber and advanced resins. Yeah, that stuff might be fun to say, but what does it actually mean? And does any of it actually make a difference for the average angler? To help you better understand fly rods, I sat down with Hank Hain, the manufacturing engineer at Rod Designer at the R.L. Winston Rod Company. Hank will walk us through how fly rods are built and how that design process makes a difference for you, the angler, while you're out on the water. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Grant, coming at you live from the land of wild trout, wild California transplants, and the R.L. Winston Rod Co. I'm sitting down here with Hank Hain, right? Like the underwear. Yep, yep. like just the E's in the wrong place. Perfect. Hank Hain and Adam Hutchison. What's up, guys? Uh, How's it going? Uh, it's going great, man. How are you guys doing? Living the dream. Yeah. Another, another Monday in Twin Bridges. Yeah. Right? Yep. Uh, there's a lot worse places to spend Mondays. Like Butte. For <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a wonderful little show lined up for you all today, all about fly rods. We're going to talk about the design process, what goes into building these rods. And then not only are we going to talk about uh, how we put these rods together, but we're also going to dive into the stuff that you need to understand about a fly rod, and how that can help you be a better angler on the water. Because we throw around words like, oh, yeah, it's got a great action, or, oh, it's real soft, or it's very responsive. And a lot of beginners, and I would venture to say, uh, Adam, you can probably speak to this a lot too, uh, a lot of, quote-unquote, advanced anglers don't even know what a lot of that stuff means. I think there's a lot of misconceptions when yeah. we talk about action. What what truly is a slow action rod? Yep. Um, and what truly is like a faster action and yeah. everything else in between. Exactly. Now, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that. Before we do, real quick, Hank uh, and Adam, introduce yourselves real quick. Uh, tell us who you are, what you do here at Winston. Yeah, so I'm. Uh, my name is Hank Hain. I am the rod designer and manufacturing engineer. Um, day to day. Really user. impressive. Yeah, yeah. Let's make a good business card, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it. <laughs> Pads the stats a little yeah. bit, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, my my day to day kind of just revolves around designing new rods all mm -hmm. the time and uh, making sure they build right, making sure all of our rods are building right, and we're not throwing away more than we try to sell. So yeah. uh, it's a cool little gig, I would yeah. have to say, for a mechanical engineer. So, that sounds like a blast. Yeah, it's fun, man. Yeah. yeah, I always I had a a dream when I was young. I was like, oh, you know, I want to be an engineer and. I really, really love to fly fish. I'd, you know, been fishing for as long as I can remember. And uh -huh. it seems like there's a lot of engineering that goes into these things and, you know, flash forward a few years and there is. So yeah, pretty sweet little, little route to find myself in. Oh, it is. It's say. great. Yeah. Yeah. Adam, what about you? And I've been with the company for, I think this is 13, almost 14 years now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so quite some time. Yeah. Uh, marketing manager now. Uh, but I've done just about every job there is to do it. Winston Rods. So, you know, from production stuff to customer service, dealer services. So I've had a lot of different conversations yeah. uh, in this business and with a lot of different anglers. And uh, it's been it's been great. A lot of fun. Been fishing pretty much my whole life as well. And uh, always loved Winston you yeah. know, from the time I was a kid. You know, it's funny, like, uh, you know, guys like uh, Landon May or Jeff Curry or you see him on, on the catalog and then you work directly with these guys so it's yeah. been a it's been a pretty fun journey for me that's awesome here, so yeah and you grew up in a non-fishy state didn't you as you know for for the you know for the general public you know, <laughs> i mean everyone knows about pyramid lake i grew yeah. up in nevada so yeah. uh from from the great basin but there's a lot of nice little secrets that i will not spill yeah. on this podcast i, I would <laughs> never dream of asking that of you. yeah just keep going to pyramid yeah. that's where everything is <laughs> I mean, you, you can catch lower 30, Provo, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can catch 30 pound cutthroat trout out of here, but so it is kind of a special fishery. Yeah, it, it really so. is. Well, awesome. Well, th I really appreciate you guys taking the time to sit down with us today. I think it's going to yeah. be good. Um, the first thing I want to touch on with you guys, though, and Hank, I think you'll be able to speak to this quite a bit, 
is give us an overview of the fly rod building process. How do one of these things get put together? Yeah, so uh, we'll talk predominantly about graphite fly rods. Um, I know a lot of people still make bamboo and fiberglass. Um, but our, us. Including us, yeah, including us. But uh, our you bread guys and butter. Got glass rod coming out? I'm not allowed to talk about that. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, our bread and butter is graphite. So um, graphite, hear that ther- term thrown around a whole lot. Uh, it's basically just carbon fiber. And that carbon fiber is made up of these super tiny little carbon filaments. They're tiny little strings. Um, and that's laid out onto a big sheet. And all those strings run in one direction or unidirectional carbon fiber is what's predominantly used. Um, and that's all held together with resin. So that resin, it likes to, it's kind of sticky and kind of tacky when it's, you know, comes right out of the uh, manufacturer, but it'll be, it'll harden once it's under heat and pressure. Um, so that's kind of keeps all those carbon filaments stuck together. So when we get our carbon fiber, it's in these huge, you know, meter wide or two foot wide rolls. You take that big sheet of carbon fiber and you'll cut out what we refer to as a flag, um, which is kind of just a trapezoidal shape. Um, And that's kind of the first pillar of your graphite fly rod. Once that piece is cut out, then you'll take that and you'll stick it onto a mandrel, which a mandrel is just a stainless steel bar that's tapered at a certain rate and a certain length. Uh, So you'll take that piece of carbon fiber, you'll stick it onto that mandrel, and then it'll go over to the rolling table, which that rolling table uses heat and pressure to kind of heat up that resin a little bit and get it moving. And then you'll hit it with a whole bunch of pressure and then roll that carbon fiber onto the mandrel. So you'll take that flat sheet and wrap it around that mandrel. So it'll go from, you know, a flat sheet of carbon fiber into a tapered shaft. Uh, Once that's there, you need something to keep it in that same shape. Uh, So what we'll do is we take uh, cellophane tape and wrap it around at a certain tension onto that uh, mandrel and onto that carbon fiber on there because that kind of acts as your cast. So when you take that part and you hang it up in the oven, um, you'll heat it, you know, 250, 300 degrees Fahrenheit for a few hours. And that tape will kind of grab down onto it, condense down onto it to hold it onto that shape. And then as you heat that stuff up, like I said, that resin hardens. So once that's done, you'll pull that out of the oven, take that carbon fiber part off the mandrel, uh, discard the tape. Um, And then you can kind of take two routes from there. You know, there's some companies that will take that part and not even sand it down or paint it. Uh, when you look at that, that's why you have those spiraled ridges on there. It's from the tape that held that on. Um, but what we'll do to get them to that beautiful Winston green is we'll take those, we'll sand them down a really, really tiny amount, um, like two thousandths of an inch, something like that, one to two thousandths of an inch. Oh, so you're, you're not working with precision here at all? No, not <laughs> at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like from the get-go, right? Yeah. Like it, if something goes wrong from the very start of the process, from card- cutting the carbon like every, yeah. everything else is moot you know it's not yeah. gonna it's not gonna build out to how it's been designed yeah, yeah the numbers that we kind of throw around with uh you know parts not building or something like that is if it's if the thickness of the, that part or your outer diameter of that part is off by less than the width of a sheet of paper so if you look at a sheet of paper and how thin yeah. that is if you're out of that tolerance it's not going to turn into a fly rod so. really it's an, it's an incredibly delicate and precise process. Um, but yeah, once you sand that blank down, you just take off that very top layer of material. Uh, that'll get painted. So um, you'll throw that Winston green paint on there. That paint requires a little bit of heat to cure it. Uh, so once you have that painted, you're pretty much almost to a completed fly rod. Uh, and all of our rods are four-piece rods right now. So once you build those out, they're actually built a little bit longer than those final parts are supposed to be because that's when... That's solely to get to that ferruling process. And that ferruling process in the briefest terms is you take all four sections of your rod and you fit them together and you have a prescribed amount that they're supposed to overlap. So like that tip and that upper midsection are supposed to order overlap by, you know, inch, maybe a little bit more. So you'll fit your parts together, cut those parts so that you have that overlap there, work all the way down the rod so you fit all three ferrules. Um, And in doing that, you'll cut them down to that final cut length. So once you assemble those rods with a whole lot of math, you'll have a nine-foot fly rod to say or however long that rod's going to be. Once those are ferruled, then it's just getting fit with furniture. So they'll throw the tip tops on, uh, put the grips on them. Then they'll go to our home wrappers. Uh, We have a great staff of home wrappers that will take those rods and a big pile of guides, and they'll wrap all those guides on. Uh, Then they'll come back to our facility 
where then they're coded. Um, so that coding will just hold that thread on there. And then all of our rods are handwritten on um, by uh, the great Barb Wire, which is our head coder. It's actually her name and she earns it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, she's phenomenal. And they write on those with uh, silver calligraphy pens. Um, so they'll write on the rods, throw that last coat on to make sure everything's secure. Um, and then they'll get the real seats glued on and shipped out and ready to go for the angler. Well, shoot, I think we can go build one now, right? That was oh, pretty definitely. Good, that was yeah, a pretty yeah. good process overview there. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yes. You guys are hired if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, w- when you're cutting that piece of graphite out at the very beginning, um, and I- I've heard this thrown around too, like the pattern that you cut that out at that point, that matters quite a bit to the overall feel and taper and action of the rod, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's one of the, like I mentioned, it's one of the core pillars of the action of your fly yeah. rod, right? Half of it is how that graphite piece is cut out because um, that's going to dictate how thick your walls are um, in that shaft, and that's going to change how stiff that part is a lot. And the other part of that is the mandrels that you're using, mm-hmm. right? If you you know, you have a really fast rate of tapered mandrel or really slow rate of tapered mandrel, that's going to dictate how stiff that rod is. Um, so those are the two most important parts. And the third part that's kind of stored in that flag is what material you're using as yeah. well. Yeah, so it's not just like any graphite. I can go down to Walmart and buy my graphite or whatever. No, you know, yeah. It's special. Yeah, we, we have, uh, not to get too deep into it, yeah. but we have very specific material properties we look for. Um, certain, you know, tensile modulus, um, and even with the resins too, that compressive modulus, there's certain numbers that we look for and certain ratios we look for that will be perfect for a fly rod that'll make it as durable as possible, as light as possible, and then also be able to be manipulated into what we want out of that fly rod, yeah. like the action that we're looking for. Yeah. Um, and that's the great part about carbon fibers. It's blown up into such a huge industry. You know, aerospace uses it a ton. Um, and we even use some materials that, might be found in the aerospace industry. Not, you know, people don't really tell us that, but at Hopefully the end of the day, not it's, on a Boeing right now, right? No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so that process is pretty similar though for all fly rods, you know, whether it's a Winston or from any mm-hmm. of the other companies, right? Yeah. I mean the, you know, the process and even it leaks into like golf shafts and stuff like yeah. that. Any tapered shaft, you're going to have to build it the same way. Okay. Um, there's different ways that you can cure it or different steps you can take, or at least how you execute those steps that will vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Um, but the core of it is all still pretty much the same, right? You cut out your carbon fiber, roll it, harden the resin, yeah. and then you go from there. Huh. Um, the unique part that with how we do it is there's human hands that touch it throughout every single process. Yeah. So there's, you know, an actual person that's cutting that graphite. Um, we, you know, we don't cut our graphite flags by hand anymore, which has helped us a ton in our consistency. And, um, but, you know, there's someone operating that machine. There's someone tacking those parts on by hand. Uh, and then there's someone sanding those parts by hand, painting them. And all of our fairling is done by hand as well. Yeah. Um, which I think is one of the unique parts of us is there's a big push for automation out there and, and just in every facet of manufacturing. Um, but we take a lot of pride in the people that do it. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that I like to talk about with people is like, yeah, rod design's cool, but it doesn't exist with a great core of people behind you that can execute that process damn near perfectly every single time. Yeah. So, so, so when we go buy a Winston and, and I will, this, this will bleed over into a little bit more uh, of this topic too, but you know, the price tag on a Winston's significantly more than what we're selling our fly flinger for here at VFC. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and, and we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, and you gave a great example of, you know, what, especially a beginner gets into this and they look at that huge price discrepancy between fly rods. And, okay, well, if the build process is the same from a cheap fly rod to a really expensive fly rod, then what's what's the deal other than the the human touch with it? What's the deal that makes them so expensive? Yeah, so I think... The biggest thing that will drive that is the quality of the material that you're using, mm. right? We we have a lot of great connections in the composite industry where we can, you know, go to one of our prepreg manufacturers, which prepreg is just a nerd term for carbon fiber. Yeah, um, we can go to our prepreg manufacturers and say, "I want this out of my resin. I want this out of my carbon fiber. I want it to be laid up in this ratio. Can you do that for me?" And they'll say, "Yep." 
there's a lead time to do it, we'll get on it. Um, so that's probably the biggest part of it is the quality of materials. Yeah. Um, but that said, there's only so many carbon fibers that'll work in a fly rod. Um, there's only so many carbon fibers that are out there that have those ideal properties. Um, the other part of it too is, and we chatted about this before the episode is when you get into those higher price point fly rods, they're kind of going to be tailored for a specific task. They're kind of going to be your performance rods, right? And that's where that Ferrari and Civic argument kind of comes into play. Um, I, I always like to use similes that relate to cars because yeah. everybody has a car, right? So it's easy to relate on that level. Um, and when you think about it, you know, when I think about myself, I'm not a race car driver. I drive to and from work every day. Sometimes I drive off road to go chase elk or go, go fishing. Yeah. So I have a pickup truck, right? I'm not worried about it zero to 60 time, but it gets the job done, right? If you're starting out as an angler and you're experimenting with what you like to do, but you just want something that'll get the job done, a good price point rod is going to do that hundred percent. Right. Um, but as you, you know, say, if I were like, Oh, I love to drive, I want to go crush lap records at Silverstone on the weekend. You know, mm -hmm. if I was close to Silverstone, that is. Uh, that's when you would think about, all right, I want a car that's going to go 0 to 60 in 2.4 seconds. I want it to be able to corner this fast and have downforce and all that crazy stuff. As an angler, when you get to that point where you're like, okay, I like this 9-foot 5 weight that I got, but I really love to go flip fish dry flies on the Spring Creek by my house. Maybe I should look at something like, you know, the seven and a half foot four weight pure that Winston has, because that rod is going to be built specifically for fishing a light line in tight conditions and making a really good presentation from like 15 feet to 35 feet. That's what that rod is just built to do. Um, so that's kind of where that separation happens. And like, I think that's a lot of people don't know that right out the gate. Cause I mean, even me, when I started fishing, I'd look at all those beautiful rods on the wall. I'm like, why would I spend that much on that rod? I can just go to Cabela's and get one for 50 bucks. Yeah. You know right. I mean, yeah. Um, but they are, you know, and that's what we specialize in, right? All of our rods are going to be built for a very specific task at hand. They're going to be built to the best of their abilities. Yeah. You know? Um, so that's kind of where that differentiation in price comes from is materials and yeah. then just built in specifically for that task. You I'll, know? I'll also say like attention to detail. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. um, I mean, if there's an error bubble on it, it's no bueno, right? Like it's taking that extra time to try and achieve perfection. There's no such thing as a perfect yep. fly rod. I mean, I don't care who you work for, what you do, how many rods you build a year. Um, but everything that we do, yeah, I mean, good enough just isn't good enough for Winston, yeah. right? And I mean, we're we appeal to you know a different different demographic, but we're also very a very much aspirational brand, right? Yeah. You know, just, you know, going back to the car analogy, you might start off with an old beater, you know, like an F-150 that you got handed down or a Blazer or something like yeah. that. But, you know, I mean, you look at an ad and you're like, hey, one day I'm going to own that yeah. vehicle. And the same thing with Winston's, right? It's it's a very aspirational thing. And, yeah. you know, it's special, right? It's something yeah. that's, that's often, you know, handed down from generation to generation, you know. So it's, it's, it's more special it's not just a tool right it's you know going back to it's like this model was made just just for me on this specific real or this specific river or lake or whatever it is you know so really you know it's an aspirational pride of ownership type of thing that we we take great pride in you know you know it's just not like hey we're gonna whip this thing out as quick as quick as we can because if if that's the case like i mean it's not we take that extra bit of time to yeah. sure it's it's a special product. It's just not yeah. another run of the mill type of deal. So. Well, I, I think that's a very good way to articulate it, guys. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that'll hopefully clear some of that up for the beginners as well. Uh, one other thing that beginners are always curious about, and I'm curious about it as well, is uh, fly rod durability, right? Like you build these things, and Hank, you're talking about working in these tiny tiny uh, mm -hmm. tolerances, right? What's sort of the the maximum strength these rods can handle before they break? You know, let, let's just go, you know, pick your your standard nine foot five weight that we talk about. Yeah. You know, could you, could you actually break that on a fish or? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. <laughs> um, you know, the tough part, 
And I don't think there's an exact value you could put on that. I mean, I could run some experiments and tell you an exact value that. Well, I'd like to see foot, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we could do it after the show. <laughs> um, but the tough part with carbon fiber, I think, you know, first off, it's not invincible, right? Um, and naturally, carbon fiber is a brittle material. But the tough part with carbon fiber is it really likes tension. So tension, basically, like you pull on it on either end, right? You're pulling on a rubber band. It doesn't really like compression, which is pushing the opposite way, right? Pushing it together. Um, but, you know, w- the way that the rods are designed, um, they are kind of built to be happy when that line is through all of the guides and pulling on it, right? What in the nerd world we'd refer to as a distributed load, right? You're taking a certain force that that fish is pulling on and that it's distributing itself all the way across the rod. Um, I think what causes a lot of breaks, at least from what I've seen, is either, you know, shock loading, which what shock loading is basically you hit that rod with a really heavy force over a really short amount of time. Um, And I've done this before personally, and I know probably everybody listening has, is hang your fly up on a rock and you just crank up on it real fast. That's shock loading your rod. Um, so what that'll do is basically that just immediately puts all those fibers in there under a super heavy load in a super short amount of time. Any material you do that to, it's going to break sooner or later. Um, so, you know, the rods are designed to undertake a pretty substantial load. I mean, when we talk about the tensile strengths of carbon fiber, we talk about the millions of pounds per square inch. So they can take an absolute beating, Mm. um, but you have to be careful when you design things and not let, you know, the walls of that tube get so thin that if you just barely do this, it'll break. Yeah. Um, and that's just the tough part with carbon fiber. But um, So you shouldn't be able to break it on a fish. No, you shouldn't. At the end yeah. of the day, it's designed to do that, yeah. right? If, if you're pulling on a fish and you're pulling the correct way, um, one thing I see a lot of that I'll, I'll mention in this setting is if you're fighting a tarpon, don't put your hand on the blank. <laughs> that's the, possibly the worst thing you could do. That grip's there for a reason, yeah. right? That grip's basically just reinforcing that rod. Yep. If you put your hand on the blank when you're fighting a fish, if you do it with a trout, it's not going to matter, right? It's it's not going to pull hard enough to break that rod. But if you're tugging on a 150-pound fish, basically what you're doing is if you think about it, if I have an I-beam sitting here and I'm holding it on one end and I'm pulling on the other end, and then I just take a little wedge and put it right in the middle, it's going to break somewhere near that right yeah. you're going to cause what's called a stress concentration which stress is force over area and it flows through your beam kind of like water does so if you put something right at that point that's going to take all that stress and it's going to concentrate it and when you have a stress concentration you're bound to have a fracture yeah. at that point um but long story short yeah our the rods are built to not break under a fish now that said i know that does happen um and that will happen where if that rod is compromised in any way you know if there's even a microscopic fracture in your material that'll slowly grow over time to a point where it does fail. Um, or if, you know, I've done it plenty of times where you smack a streamer into the tip section of your seven weight. If there's anything that's looks wrong on the front of that, there's high odds. It's going to break sooner or later. Yeah. Well, I, um, I did that to, uh, an, uh, an old Nexus actually. Mm-hmm. Adam sent me one to review and I sent it back to him broken cause I hit the tip with a mouse Nice. <laughs> and I felt so bad about it. I called him up. I was like, hey, I broke that rod you sent me. And he's like, oh, okay, well, send it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but We'll fix it. Speaking of breaking rods, though, I mean, Adam, you said you worked in the customer service side of this. What, do you have some stories about broken rods that you can? Because <laughs> from what we're hearing from Hank, it really shouldn't break, right, yeah. on a fish. So, I, I mean, walk us through if you've got any fun stories I, on, I think on broken rods. Gosh, there's, there's, there's a few, right? Like, I, one, of, one of my favorite ones is uh, this guy. He was fishing in Alaska. He was, I believe he was brown bear hunting, though. Uh-huh. He also had his fly rod there. Well, they ended up um, harvesting this giant brown bear, and it died out in the middle of the lake. And, oh, you no. know. Guys being guys, you know, they're like, oh, we're not going to get wet. So, hucked out like this huge streamer, let lodge itself into a thousand pound bear, you know, and proceeds to shock load it, I, I believe, like load that thing up and just yanking it around and trying to drag the bear back in. I think, I think they got it back in, 
but not before like a mid two or mid three. You know, failed. Oh, so, but uh, did he try to warranty that? Yeah, he did. We, <laughs> <laughs> we took care of it. You know, he was honest. So nice. we've had oh. plenty of rods burn in fires. You know, where yeah. uh, people just sent us back like rod ashes. And, you know, <laughs> wanting to uh, cover that under warranty. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think the most recent one that our now customer service guy Luke uh, had in a guy did not lock his rod vault. This was actually at Pyramid Lake in Nevada and proceeds to drive back into Reno. Well, this rod exits the rod vault and proceeds to get drugged behind the vehicle oh, for, I don't know, what is it, 40 miles going back into town from? Yeah, from, it's, it's close to 40. It's quite might, a might be more, might be 50-ish, yeah. Well, the, the reel was gone, long gone. Yeah. And then there was just like an exoskeleton shell of a rod. You know? <laughs> Heartbreak. So, but uh, yeah, you know, stuff happens. And, you know, as Hank alluded to, it's carbon fiber. It's not, yeah, it's not bulletproof material, right? It, yeah. It, we're working with really thin, I think manufacturers, us, everybody, we really push those limits to see how light, durable, you know, yeah. and I think there's a fine line there, but. Ultimately, you know, it's a thin wall of carbon fiber that, you know, it's we and on the customer service side, we always we more or less have a have a rule of first, right? First cast, first fish, first time out. You know, we'll generally take care of that. If you know, we I think people need to understand we we can't tell you exactly what happened until we have the rod. And even after we get the rod, yeah, we probably won't be able to tell, but we can see if there's something funky going on with that material. Um, so, you know, send it in something weird happens. It's probably, you know, I've been fly fishing for a long time and I can honestly say that not a single rod that I've ever broken has been because, because of a manufacturing defect, you know, yeah. it's because some kind of ex- external incident happened yep. and then the rod broke. But I mean, look, we're all human here, Yeah, There's human hands building these rods and, you know, it's part of the beauty of Winston as well is it's just not a machine yeah. that's pooping out fly rods. You know, <laughs> you're, not, you're not throwing a big wad of carbon into a uh, into a conveyor belt and it's just throwing out yeah. a instant rod. It's a yep. human person, yeah. you know, doing that. And if we're off microscopically, you know, yep. who knows? But most of the time it is external forces that, yeah. you know, weaken, weaken the carbon in some way. And Yeah, and even like if you hit your fly rod with nymphs or split shot too, that'll, that can sometimes be enough to cause an issue, right? Oh, totally. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, split, split shot's really heavy and, yeah. you know, it's just like shooting a, shooting it with a BB gun, yeah. you know, you're, when you cat cast split shot, it, it zinks, yeah. right? You it's moving. One. Yeah. I don't know how many people have hit themselves in the back of the head with some split shot, but it doesn't or, feel good. <laughs> or a conehead yeah. bugger. Hey, you know, I've heard guys like kill birds, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that are flying by. Yeah, I've heard a guy that killed a bat, you really? know, by hucking a streamer or something like that, hit it right in the head. And it, I mean, those things are moving, yeah. right? So a yeah, they're thin, hauling. thin piece of carbon fiber is just not. Maybe I'll try that next pheasant season. Yeah. <laughs> bring a shotgun, <laughs> just bring a seven weight. Seven weight and start false casting Seven, it. seven yeah. weight in a dungeon. Yeah, <laughs> that might be all you need. Yeah. <laughs> well, one more thing on this before we move on. Uh, I would love to get some tips from you guys about – how we can uh, take care of our rods to make sure that they're not going to break, make sure they're going to last for as long as possible. I know um, one story I've got, I've got an old B3X from you guys, probably 10 years old at this point. Is it, have I known you for that long, Adam? Uh, probably longer. Probably, I was, I was yeah. trying to think of how long we've known each other. Yeah, it's been a minute. Then. Yeah. Anyways, it, it's Fish a, West days, I think. Yeah, back yep. in Fish West. Yeah, so it must have been 10 years ago, huh? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that little B3X of mine, I love it. One of my favorite rods. And I put it away wet one night. And the next morning, I got it out, and all the the guide wraps had clouded over. And a couple of them had mildewed. And even the bottom inscription part, like, I went to clean it off, and it actually just, like, slept away. Mm. So it's like I have half an inscription left on the rod. But the worst part was the water got into the real seat and expanded the real seat so much that I couldn't get the rings up and down. Mm. Um, and thankfully when it dried out, I could, but the real seat's kind of cracked and not so good looking. I'm actually going to drop it off with you guys today, but, uh, I had that issue and 
never really even thought twice about it, and I should have because I, I know better than to put a rod away wet, but some beginners might not, right? So what are some of the other, like, dummy-proof ways to make sure you don't ruin a nice fly rod uh, that you guys could share with us? I think the easiest thing to do is just do your best to put that thing away every time. I mean, we're in the heart of fit fishing season, and I'm a, you know, I'm guilty of this. I, I have a few. I'm lucky to work here where I have a few rods where it's. Oh, this is my <laughs> Poindexter rod. This is my Beaverhead River rod. This is yeah. my big old rod, right? This is my streamer stick, and they just, they just. But there are some special rods that I take down. But that said, you know, I've made some mistakes where it's like throw, you know, throw the rod in the back of the truck, and you're moving between spots. You know, who knows what's going to happen on the highway? You're going to kick up some gravel or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, so always do your best to put that rod away in its sock and tube, right? That's why we send a rod with the sock and tube every time. That's, yeah. that's the best way to protect your rod every time. You're like, look, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm guilty of traveling without putting that thing away every time. Oh, me who, too. Who wants to do that? Yeah. Right. But, um, that's, that's a good way to keep that rod safe. So, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I know I, I, the one advice I'll give is, um, touched on it a little bit with shock loading the rod. Yeah. The best advice I could give anybody is like, if you hang up your flies, $2 worth of flies is more than, is, is a better trade than breaking your. But that's the last rod. fly right. that I had of that kind, <laughs> Hank. I need it. You shouldn't be fly fishing if that's the last fly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I wish somebody would tell Alex that because every time I need a fly from him, oh, sorry, this is my last one. <laughs> last 10. Um, no, yeah. I mean, like, if you hang up with, uh, if you hang up on a rock, if you're trout fishing or something like that, it's best just to point the rod at it and then break it off like that. Yeah. Or find a better rower that can back row and get get back to the rock. That too. Go on a rescue mission. Not all of us are bougie enough to be in a drift boat every time, okay? <laughs> yeah. Some uh, of us are promised drift boat trips and then the weather gets in the way. I mean, you know. <laughs> Getting old, <laughs> getting subtle, old, subtle blow there. <laughs> uh, no, but I mean, when you, if you, you know, crank on your rod when it's hung up or something like that, it's basically just loading that rod the way it wasn't designed to be loaded. Yeah. And at that point, like I mentioned, you're going to get stress concentration somewhere mm-hmm. in that rod and it's, it might break, especially if you're doing this. I mean, I do that sometimes too, but I'm, I know I'm going to break the rod when I do that. Almost, it's a rod I don't like. You know, if it's made by somebody else, I'm like, I'm tired of this rod. Let me just break it really fast. <laughs> to, to that point, like if your feral connections are loose too, and you do that, that's mm. you see that probably more than any. We see that more than anything. Like a feral works lo- loose, and then you load that rod up. That's how you crack your ferals really easy because yep. they're meant to be fully seated, mm. right? Um, so that's check your ferals, right, and. I mean, if the rod, if the rod isn't feraled correctly or seated all the way down, that that's obviously a change in the design and puts a weak spot mm-hmm. right there when you're doing that. Yeah. So awesome. Well, I think that was really valuable going over the fly rod design process. And Hank and Adam, you both mentioned stuff about action of the rod and line weight and uh, and other stuff. So I, I do want to focus on now that we know how a fly rod is built, I would like to dive into what does that design process actually mean for an angler out on the water? How does that, all that time and energy you spend into, into building these rods, what does that do for us when we're out on the water? What are we going to see? And I think there's four key things that we really need to dive into. And the first one of those is action. So I'd love for both of you guys go through, tell me, First off, let's explain. Let's just start right there. Let's just, what is fly rod action? I I think the best way to describe it is how much that rod is bending. Mm -hmm. It sounds really general, but at least to break it down, how we'll look at the fly rod for this is in four sections as a four-piece rod. Um, And since it's natural for me to clear up the confusion, um, you know, tip section is the very top. The mid two in my brain is that section that connects to your tip. And then mid three is the next one down, butts, of course, your butt section where yep. your handle is. Um, so the action of that rod, at least when we look at it in terms of that four-piece rod, is which of those parts is flexing the most and how much of it is flexing. Um, so the first example I'll dive into, because I think a lot of people are tired of hearing about fast action rods, is what does that fast action rod actually look like? At least what our definition is here at 
Winston rods. Um, to us, that fly rod, that fast action fly rod is you're going to see most, if not all of your flex in that first half of the rod, right? So that tip and that mid two are going to be what's, what you're mostly casting, right? Um, and I think like Andy Mills said it, you know, like a saltwater rod, the back half should be reserved for fighting fish. Um, so that's kind of the idea of that fast action rod, right? So you're going to have a good, soft, playful tip. Um, you're going to have ample flex in that mid two, so you still have feel in that fly rod. Um, and then you might see some flex in the very front end of that mid three, but really that is back there reserved to, you know, generate a lot of power and a lot of line speed. Um, it's never just going to be 100% stiff because if it was, that fly rod would be garbage. Yeah. Um, so you're gonna, not going to see as much flex, if not any, in that back half section. Um, but you're really just trying to cast the front of that fly rod. And what that's going to do for the angler is that's going to swing really light, right? Um, and I I think there's a lot of discrepancy between when people say it feels light in hand and it has a light swing weight. How you can think about that swing weight is, you know, if I'm holding two feet of a two by four and swinging it through the air, it feels really light. If I hold six feet of a two by four through the air, it's going to feel really heavy. Yeah. Right. So if you're swinging that fast action rod, if you're only moving and trying to push half of that rod through the air, that's going to generate a really light swing weight. Yeah. Right? And that swing weight is how heavy it feels in your hand when you're casting. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, the materials that you use and how much that material you use does play a role in that. Mm. But at the end of the day, if you're only bending half of that rod, it's going to feel really light. Right. So you're going to have a good light swing weight. Um, that rod's going to be really, really powerful. You know, since you don't have a lot of flex in that bottom half, there's a lot of reserved energy in there. So if you're fishing in the wind, you know, trying to form a really small, tight loop to cut through the wind, that rod's really going to excel at that. Um, you can play around with fishing heavy lines on that rod as well, just because you have so much reserved power back there. Um, and the best part about them too, like I mentioned, is you're going to be able to reef on fish with that thing. Yeah. You know, if you have so much stiffness in the back of that rod you can really put some pressure on on a big fish and turn their head um so that's kind of the idea of a fast action rod um when you get into trout rods it kind of turns into a gray area of a fast fast action rod but it's still going to be pretty much the same thing right you're mm -hmm. going to see most of that flex in the front half of the rod um when you shift to more of a moderate fast action rod you're still going to see flex in that front half right because it's really tiny and that's where you're going to generate feel um, but really your flex point is going to start to move back. So like the way that I think of it is a moderate fast action rod, you're still going to have a good soft tip in mid two, um, but you're going to see more and feel more flex in that bottom half, that mid three, you're going to have more bend in there, maybe a little bit more in the butt section. Um, and those rods are like, those are going to be the rods that are going to feel really good at short distances, right? Because it's going to take a very low amount of force to engage deeper into that blank. So you can put 15 to 20 feet out of the tip of that rod and you'll be able to feel that whole rod flexing, which that's where a lot of people talk about, oh, this rod feels dead in the hand or something like that. That's just how much that rod's flexing, right? Mm -hmm. So those moderate fast action rods, you'll lose a little bit of performance in the wind for sure. Um, but having that much flex and feel into what that rod's doing when you're casting kind of opens up the conversation then of making really delicate presentations, um, you know, fishing lighter lines and lighter flies. It's going to be easier to do on that. Yeah. Um, so and, yeah, that's, you get more feedback as the angler too. So you can feel when your, your line unloads on your back cast yep. as well with those moderate rods. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And I think for beginners, it's important to know, um, that the weight of the line loads the rod. It's yep. the weight of the lure, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Conventional tackle, the weight of the lure is bending that rod because you're just casting really light monofilament, right? Yep. Here in fly fishing, you're using a heavy tapered fly line, right? That's matched to go on to a specific fly rod, right? Yeah. So like if you have a fast action five weight versus a moderate action five weight, right? Like Hank said, that fast action rod is much stiffer the further up, higher up that blank, whereas that material we use in a moderate action flexes deeper towards the handle of the rod and transmits more, more feel, right? So, you know, that's where it comes down to like, what, how am I fishing? What, what do yeah. I need? Right. And that's, you know, that's where we kind of get into like various fly rods. Rods, yeah. rods are a lot like golf clubs, yeah. right? When you start golfing, you need like a driver, a wood, an iron, and a 
putter, right? Like, but as you get into golf, right, you just all of a sudden you have hybrid clubs and different wedges and I mean, four or five woods, right? Yeah. Maybe two different drivers, depending on who you are, how nerdy you are, right? So that's, that's really how it comes down to. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. That's what it boils down to. So is there a best action then for a beginner? Should beginners only gravitate towards fast rods, moderate rods? What What's your two cents? That's kind of tough because, I mean, I, I prescribe to the fact that, like, before you buy a fly rod, always cast it, right? Yeah. Because everybody has a different casting cadence and a different casting stroke. So, like, I find myself leaning more towards moderate fast action rods these days, but... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't ever shy away from a fast action rod. At heart, I'm an angry caster, I like to say, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, if if you would have to choose one for a beginner, I would lean more towards a fast action rod. And that's solely because they're going to be a lot more forgiving. With moderate action rods, you have to be a little bit more dialed in your timing of when, you know, to bring your forward cast forward or bring your back cast back. Um, that's just because you need that rod to load a little bit more and that can take some more time, right. To actually get that line to tug on the rod. Got to be a little bit more patient. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit more patient. Um, so fast action rods are really forgiving. You know, if you as an angler and all of us have been through this, you're figuring out your timing of that casting stroke and things like that, that fast action rod can kind of take any input you put into it and make it work. Right. Um, and, and fast action rods are really nice, too, because, you know, if you live in Montana and the wind likes to blow, it can handle that, you know? It doesn't no matter. blow like it does in Wyoming. That's fair. We, we got you beat. Yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> I've spent my fair share of time in Wyoming, and yeah. I'm glad I own a lot of six weights because of that state. But, uh, yep. yeah, I, I, if I had to pick one, I would say fast action. But at the end of the day, if you are a beginner angler and you want to look at a fly rod, just – do your research and go cast a bunch and especially cast a bunch with a bunch of different fly lines too. Yeah. Cause the fly line can change a lot. In a row. We're going to get onto fly lines real quick. I'm getting ahead of you. No, no, you're completely <laughs> fine. Adam, did you, do you agree with Hank on that action part or? I think as far as versatility, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Because you know, one of the great things about fast action rods, you can overline them. So if you really want to get more feel on it, so you have a fast five, you can put a six weight on there and it bends and, you know, lines these days. I mean, a fi- I mean, really fly, we'll get, we'll get there. We'll yeah. dive into fly lines, but that's, that's one thing with the fast action rod. I, you know, the, the other way to think about it is, you know, really the essence of fly fishing is fly casting. Yeah. Right? That's what makes fly fishing unique, you know, and there, I yep. mean, certainly there's, um, you know, when you're throwing indicators or, you know, whatever there's, you're doing the windshield wiper cast, but it's not really how most fly rods are designed. Most fly rods are designed to cast loops, right? Yep. And in that light, light, if you're, if you're a patient person, you know, you have time and you're really getting into the sport. That's one of the beautiful things about moderate action rods is that they transmit that energy and they are harder to cast, but you feel so much more, right? You're able to understand how much force it takes to throw, you know, what you need to do to manipulate a tight loop and a wide loop. And then you start figuring out like, Hey, if I'm dry fly fishing, I'm going to throw a wider, wider loop because I don't want a splashy presentation. Right. Or if I'm casting the wind, I need to add a little bit more, a little bit more to it to tighten up my loop. So you can cut through the wind a little bit better. So from a teaching standpoint, you know, like, and from learning how rod loads and what it means, what that load means, you know, moderate, moderate, fast action rod is a good, good rod to really learn how to fly cast off of, right? Because fast action rods, they just don't transmit that feel quite as well. And they are certain moderate action rods. I mean, you think about a bamboo rod, right? Super slow recovery, some, some tapers, right? Hard to cast, yeah, like really hard to cast, but that's, I mean, if you're, if you're getting, if you really want to get better and you learn how to cast a bamboo rod really, really well, guess what? You can cast anything really yep. well, right? That's, that's the other end yeah. of it. So oh, I love it. Yeah. I, I cleared up a bunch on action. I uh, thank you guys. Now line weight, we said we were going to get to this. Um, why does the fly line that you pick matter so much for your fly rod? I think it's just because, um, I, I mean, if we're being honest, the fly line industry is pretty wild, right? Yeah. Now. 
I mean, between like all the aft to standards, half size heavy, full size heavy, true to line weight, gets a little bit daunting. And why would they make, not to cut you off, but why would they, why would these manufacturers bother with like a half weight heavy fly line? Like, what's the point behind that? I, I'd have to talk to them a little bit more, but I think from our understanding, um, from a lot of the testing we've done in prototyping rods is it kind of comes down to the application, right? It's very, the way I see it, it's very similar to a fly rod, right? If I'm going to be going and chasing bull redfish in Louisiana, I want a fast action eight weight, right? And maybe I want a little bit heavier line to pair with that fast action eight weight so that if that bull redfish is on my toes or 40 feet away, that line will work with my rod and generate enough feel so that I can make a good cast. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, the tapers of your fly lines, I think especially a, a lot of them do a really good job of explaining what that taper is built to do. Um, you know, if you're going to be fishing dry flies, a longer head is going to be great because you can aerial mend that thing. Um, you know, if you're making a longer presentation or a shorter presentation, that line's going to work well with that rod. Um, but you know, when we look at fly lines here, what we've done as of late, especially with the Air 2 Max, um, I might lean on that example a little bit just because it's fresh meat. Yeah. Um, New fly rod from Winston, by the way, the Air 2 Max. Yes. So it's fast, pretty, it's, a fast action Winston. Right? Yes. Fast. Pretty mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what we did with the Air 2 Max is we kind of thought, you know, what would we want to use all of these rods for? Mm. What are the best fly lines we could use for these? Right. And we kind of designed them around those lines. And you know, there's a lot of marketing that we put out there that like they really sing with a quarter size to a half size heavy line. And that was 100% by design, right? Because we wanted to retain that Winston feel, but with a really down and dirty fast action rod. Um, and so, I lost my train of thought there a little bit. <laughs> oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, if you're, um, you know, using the Air 2 Max example, that nine foot eight weight, it'll really run with like those redfish lines that are half size heavy, which that half size heavy nomenclature is based off of the AFTTA or AFTA standards, right? Um, if anybody's curious, have never heard of it, you can look it up on Google. Yeah. Um, but th that was done on purpose because, you know, when we thought about that rod and we thought about how they lined up, like I mentioned before, you know, if I'm chasing bull redfish or going after bonefish, I want this rod to perform a certain way. So I'm going to match up that certain line to it. Um, and that's kind of where it gets sticky too, you know, and overlining and underlining rods, the fly line manufacturers already kind of do that for you, mm -hmm. you know, with especially like the jungle taper that's out there. I don't know why you would make it two times heavy, but I'd have to talk it, talk to somebody at scientific yeah. anglers to understand that. But, uh, well, Adam, you brought that up, I think under or overlining a fly rod, what, like, why would I ever under overline one of my rods? If I, what's that going to do for me? Like if you overline a rod, you want it to transmit more feel down into your hand. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, so you're not, you know, you need more feel up close. So if you have a fast action five weight and you're trying to catch a fish at 40 feet, you can't feel that rod load, which, you know, feels an important part because you know when that's rod, that rod's loaded. So you know when you need to come forward on your, on your cast, right? So if you can't feel that, it's hard to gauge how much lines out or how accurate you can you can really be, right? So that's that's why you would overline it and vice versa for underlining it, right? Yeah. So um, I like to compare lines to like shotgun shells, right? And Hank, Hank hit it right on the head. It's all about application, right? Yeah. You have a lot of different shot sizes for a 12, 12 gauge, right? Yep. You have eight shot, you have seven, seven and a half, you have six, four, Different birds, you know, different types of skeet shooting. Yep. I you know, sporting clays, whatever it is, right? So you have, yeah, they're all 12 gauge. They all work in a 12 gauge, but you don't want to use five shot on a morning dove. Right. Yeah. Same thing with fly rods, right? Like if you're fishing streamers, you don't want to cast a long tapered trout taper, you know, on that, on that rod because that fly is going to own it, right? Own that, own that line. Right. So I think there's a little bit there. Right. Fly size is something to consider as well. I think that's the other thing. Fly size. Yeah. Tight, tight. If you're indicator fishing, you know. So if you're throwing a big streamer, that's where you go. In those maybe overweighted lines, which help combat the weight of that fly as well. So you yeah. have to take in consideration rod action, 
you know, how you're fishing, what flies you're fishing. You know, there's a lot of versatile lines out there these days, like the half size, but even true to weights, right? You look at some of the shapes of those tapers, those line tapers, right? Um, and that's probably, I mean, setting you guys up for a conversation with the line company. So yeah. <laughs> shout out SA or Rio, you yeah. know, like Airflow, you know, yep. like, but anyways, I mean, that's, that's the other way to think about it is lines do different things and Hank hit it right on the head, yeah. right? Like it's, you can get application specific, which, you know, it's, it can be confusing, but it's really a blessing. Like you, like our air twos are versatile enough. Our air two freshwater rods are versatile enough to take a true to line weight, the really delicate dry fly, dry flies, but then you can put on a slightly heavier line, do dry dropper stuff. You could even do like an overweighted line and just all that's doing is it's loading the rod deeper, the yep. heavier you get and the lighter you get, the less it's, less it's loading. But you think about a trout taper, really long head on that thing, right? You put a 12 foot leader on there. That's a, that's a pretty heavy, that's a pretty heavy line all of a sudden, but to get to that mass, you need more line out of the tip top of your rod. Yeah. Right? So, mm-hmm. Look, cast the rods, cast the lines, right? Talk to talk to your dealer, talk talk to some experts, and they'll help you get dialed in. And there's a lot of great middle of the road lines that are just gonna do about everything you want. Yep. Right. Exactly. So, but. Well, I appreciate that, guys. And if any of the stuff that uh Adam and Hank just shared went over your head a little bit, we do have a masterclass video all about fly lines. So go check that out because not enough people watch the fly line video. People want to know about fly lines, but the fly line content like does awful mm-hmm. for us. It, it's it's one of those things. People have questions about it, but then when you give the content to them, they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to watch that. It's kind of boring. <laughs> like, well, quit asking the question then. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. When you're a fly angler, you have to be. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, to talk a little bit more about it too, AFTA is our governing body of the fly fishing industry, yeah. just to clarify that. So. You know, everyone's heard uh, American Fly Fishing Trade Association is yep. what AFTA stands for, right? So we're, as, as as a manufacturer, you know, any manufacturer for that matter, there's a there's a window that classifies a five weight, right? There's a light end and then there's, there's the heavy end, right? For a five weight rod or a five weight line. Well, five, it's hard to say, but yeah. AFTA <laughs> defines it. We don't, you don't have to live in that definition. Yep. You can go beyond it. But um, that, just to clarify, that yeah. there's a governing body that says, hey, this is how we define a five-weight rod. This is how we or define a five-weight line. And we try to def- design our rods around that, that yeah. window right mm-hmm. there. Yeah. It's not to say they won't go outside of that window, but yeah, just to clarify, that's what AFTA. No, I appreciate it. That was a good is. clarification. Thank yep. you, guys. So let's talk about fly rod length for a minute. What's the deal with nine feet? Why is that? the the magic sauce that we've seemed to have landed on as an industry no idea no i'm kidding <laughs> I, I was about to say really you had me going there man. <laughs> no uh I, I i think uh that nine foot length um you, know, you think of it i think of it from a physics standpoint you know it's kind of that perfect balance right if you go longer like you know you pick up a 10 foot rod it's going to kind of feel heavy um at least just in terms of single hand rods Um, That nine foot rod, it's kind of that perfect balance of, it's just long enough to where it's really easy to generate feel, right? Build a really good blank out of it. Um, From an angling perspective, it's really versatile at about everything you can do. You know, you can fish it out of a drift boat, fish it in the salt water, fish it on small spring creeks, um, and everything in between. From a design standpoint, that's kind of the perfect length of rod to get really good torsional stability, which torsional stability basically is like, if I bend a beam this way, it wants to keep bending that way. If it's torsionally unstable, it'll kind of bend off yeah. axis, right? So I, I need every guest to be this considerate, Hank, because I, I was about <laughs> to ask, explain torsional stability, and you just went ahead and did it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it, it moves in the line it's supposed to, to yeah. have that side exactly. Side yeah. yeah, and of course, you know, if you go to a shorter rod blank, it's just going to make being torsionally stable even better, which is why yeah. we advertise shorter rods and a lot of other people advertise shorter rods are more accurate. That's kind of where that, that claim comes from. You can get a little bit tighter loop with that shorter rod, can't you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that nine foot, it's just kind of that perfect balance of it's not too long and heavy. It's not way too short where you wish you had more rod in certain applications. Um, especially with a nine footer, the great part about those is you can overhand cast them really well. And you can roll cast them really well. Yeah. You know, because roll casting is all about torque. 
overhand casting is all about velocity, right? So that's kind of, I think that's why nine foot is kind of that sweet little butter zone. Yeah. Is there a, is there a particular longer or shorter rod that you love a lot? Either one of you guys? Eight and a half feet. How come? Just because eight and a half feet, I think is. Dorothy's porridge. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just right. It's yeah. just right. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah, eight and like an eight foot, six inch rod. You see a lot of them in trout sizes. Yeah. You don't see a lot of them in saltwater sizes. So that's, especially with the Air 2 Max, that's why we did that. And like that eight foot, six inch range, if you're going for a really soft yet accurate dry fly rod, it's awesome. But if you want to beef it up to like a nine weight that you can pick up 30 feet of line and shoot it to the next state, it's awesome for that. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of eight sixes. I own way too many eight sixes. Uh, I'm in that same boat, Hank. I love yep. them. Yeah. I think in the past, you know, uh, pre-movie, and when we say movie, we talk about the river. River runs runs through it. My least favorite movie of all time. <laughs> Shout the, out Brad Pitt. <laughs> the uh, eight and a half foot rod back in those days was the versatile length. Yeah. Right? Like, and then, you know, it's, you look at fly fishing, right? And I've been in the industry 13 years and seeing the growth in application has been incredible. You know, like 25 years ago, you needed a great dry fly rod, a streamer rod. There were hardly any indicators, you know. Now yeah. we have how many indicators on the market, right? Like, let's talk about streamers, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Triple articulated stuff, you know. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to catch fish now that we really didn't explore 20, 30 years ago, right? So that kind of goes back to the whole, you know, my, you know, my quiver, right? Like yeah. Now you need, now you need a 10 foot rod if you're fishing lakes just to keep fishing lakes or nymphing just to keep line off the water. So you, you can mend a lot easier without disrupting the drift, right? Or you're fishing, you know, there's a lot of different, there's just a lot more ways to catch fish, right? And if you're nymphing, a short rod isn't great for that, for lifting line off the water, right? Um, same thing. Like if you need to be accurate up close, short rods better, right? Like if I'm, my main goal is be accurate 40 feet and in, like a nine foot rod, nine and a half foot rod isn't going to be super fun, right? Yeah. It goes back to that feel, like how quick do you need that rod to load under what distance, right? So that's that's the other way to think of, think of it. And, you know, rod length is certainly that. Shorter, the shorter the rod, the faster it's going to turn over. I think yeah. using like a, if you're choking up on a baseball bat, you're going to swing that bat a lot faster. Mm -hmm. If you choke up down low on that bat, you know, it goes back to the kind of what we were talking about earlier, right? But yeah, that's the same thing to think about shorter rod versus longer rod. And like if you're going to go fish a ch willow choke stream full of cutthroat or brookies, nine foot rod isn't going to be much fun in there, no. right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, can can you do it? Absolutely, but you're probably going to be swearing yourself upside yeah. upside down before <laughs> before you catch a fish, losing right? a few flies too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. most definitely. So, yeah, that's the other way to think yeah. about it. But. Doing some tree trimming. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I I keep joking in our starter packs. We need to set a pair a pair of hedge trimmers too. Oh, so yeah. with with all of them, but I don't think uh, I don't think Alex and Berkeley are uh, <laughs> as uh, as sold on that idea as I am. Um, all right, I think the last thing we're gonna we're gonna wrangle here, guys, is the ideal length and line combo for beginners because we send so many folks to the nine foot five weight, and I think we do that because it's very versatile rod length and weight. But should beginners be looking elsewhere? We're we're talking just trout beginners. I know if you're gonna go for the bass stuff, we're we'll probably gonna tell you you know grab a six. If you're just gonna be fishing pan fish, you know four weights gonna probably be your ideal, but for trout anglers, we send them to the nine foot five weight. Should we keep doing that, or should we be maybe thinking about, you know, maybe maybe you need a six, or maybe you only need a four, or maybe you need an eight and a half? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it'll pain me to say this because I prescribe to the Church of the Six Weight being the most versatile rod, but um, <laughs> no, I think I think the nine foot five weight is for trout anglers by far the most versatile rod, and that's yeah. solely because you know, well built five weight paired up with a good line. Um, you can do pretty much about everything with it. You know, it's, it might lack in some areas, right? Like we were talking about, if you're in a willow choke stream, nine foot rod, you'll have your struggles, but it'll still get it done. Yeah. Right. 
Um, and I think with a well-built five weight, the beauty in that rod length and weight combo is you can throw dry flies on it and still get a really good light presentation. Um, you can turn over a nymph rig with it and you can throw streamers with it. Yeah. Um, and that really covers everything you want to do with trout. And then even just the setting of river you're on or lake too. If you're on a lake, your nine foot five weight will still get the job done, right? Yeah. If you're on a little tailwater or on the massive Missouri river, you can fish that nine foot five weight just about everywhere. Um, it pains me not to say a six weight solely because I know a six weight cannot present tiny dries very well. But yeah. if you live in a place with a lot of wind, maybe a six weight would be good, but, and if you don't like to fish dry flies, but if you want yeah. to do a little bit of everything, that nine foot five weight is going to be right up your alley. Yeah. Adam, what about you? You know, I, I agree with Hank. Like yeah. that, if you're looking to get the most bang for your buck, you know, nine five is absolutely the way to go. You know, you it, fish is dry as well. Fish is stream. I mean, you can do anything with it and do it really well with a lot of enjoyment, right? Yeah. I do being the sales guy here at Winston as well. <laughs> I think everybody needs to own two rods, bare, yeah. bare minimum. Every, I mean, you need to own two rods just because, especially if you're in, in into it, right? You need to own two rods just, just because you're going to get more enjoyment out of it. I'm not saying you have to own two Winston rods, though you should. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> After you bought your, uh, all the flies from Ventures Fly. That's company, right. That's okay. right. That's right. right. But it, in all reality, two rods, you're going to get much more enjoyment. And that, then we're talking about building a quiver, right? Yep. So you can start with the five. That's great, right? Five's great. I like to space it out. Whether you go with the five, you should your next rod should be a seven or a three, right? If you get a six, your next your next rod should be a four or an eight, depending on how you fish and where you're located, right? So if you're a trout angler, if you get a five weight, a great complement to that five is going to be a three, you know? And you got your delicate dry fly rod, then you got your versatile trout rod for drift boat yeah. fishing or lakes, right? So I think if you can only own one for for whatever reason, you know, it's pretty foolish to me. Like only one one fly <laughs> rod is just, just a joke, you yeah. know? Why would you do that? You should own 10. Let's be honest here. But, uh, you know, two rods, you should really look at that, right? And do it affordably, yeah. right? Whatever, you know, look at your budget, do it affordably, and you, you really don't can. take out a second mortgage on the house. <laughs> now, now you, what would you say, Adam, if I told you I had 41 fly rods? Is that too many? Is that not, not enough. enough? Hank says not enough. Not enough. They who die with the most wins. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I have you beat? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, I work at Winston. I can borrow as many rods as I want. Yeah, I know. You know. So I, you I rub it in. I think, <laughs> I think I'm at 20. Yeah. You know, don't tell my wife, but I'm at 20. Yeah. Right? So, um, but uh, no, I think, I, yeah. I seriously think owning two rods, you're going to get the most enjoyment out of it. I agree. Start, start with a five, yeah. right? But as you grow, like, hey, I like to throw streamers, then go to a seven. Would, or, hey, would you agree with this assessment that? Because we, we get that a lot. People are like, what should my next fly rod be? And I, me and Alex have had a lot of conversations about this. I'll get kind of uppity and be like, well, you don't need anything else. You need your five weight because most people can't cast that five weight properly. So I've always told people in, in not a, a mean way, of course, uh, well, it doesn't do you any good to buy another fly rod unless you can accurately and adequately fish the one that you've got. Is that, is that a fair thing to say? Oh, hundred okay. percent. I think, I think, you know, you should own two, but you start with one, right? Yep. You can't fish two rods at once. No. So if you're, I don't know, Santa Claus or somebody. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, right. <laughs> uh, buy one, get really proficient at it, get, become a proficient caster and then like figure out like, Hey, what do I need? You'll yeah. know after fishing that rod for a year, like you're like, Oh, I need a three weight because I'm yep. I'm in the willows. Yep. And- You'll start to realize and understand the why behind needing that three weight. You don't just That's buy right. the three weight because oh I'm gonna go fish these small streams. You might not fish small streams, right? Yeah. You might mm-hmm. fish streamers out of a lake, and you're like, man, my five weight's really struggling. Yeah, right. It's working, but I'm not. I'm my arm hurts. I'm really pushing it. I'm not letting yeah. the rod do the work. I need I need a seven weight to do that. Yeah. that type of deal, right? So yeah. well, and the small streams too. You might be. I mean, you might just be fishing pocket water the whole time, in, in which case you want the nine footer still. You don't want the seven and a half. Well, now you if need it's three all rods, water. right? Yeah, exactly. Because then you need your, your <laughs> small slippery slope again. Yep. And then so. you go, uh-huh. then you end up like me, 
living in Wyoming with 40, <laughs> 41 fly rods. So, it's, hey, you know what? That actually doesn't sound too bad. Yeah. No, not at all. <laughs> I'm pretty jealous right now, actually. Uh, no, so own one, own yeah. one, but plan on buying two just because there's, you're not just fishing one way. And, you know, when you realize, like, man, I wish I had, as soon as you say that, I wish I had a three weight or a seven weight, then. Then you know you're ready. But I think I think Hank's right. Start yeah. with a start with a five weight, you know. Start with a five or a six weight, uh, depending on you know. Ask some questions, you know. Look at where you live, right? For uh, Hank's right. Like if you live in Twin Bridges, Montana, like we do, we fish a lot of streamers and we have big rivers, right? And we have a lot of wind, so we always almost always default on a six weight just because. Hey, that the, the second thing that we do most of the time is Spring Creek dry fly fishing, right? Yeah. So we we want a four weight in some fashion mm-hmm. to achieve that delicacy and tippet protection, right? That a six weight's not going to deliver on. But that's just a really clean, awesome quiver for for Montana. Now, if you live in the driftless area in Wisconsin, right, like that quiver's probably going to change a little bit, yeah. right, than what we're using out here. So look at where you live regionally. Look at your waters that you generally are going to be fishing and base your quiver around that. Awesome. How you're going to fish in the waters that you're surrounded by. No so. matter what that next rod is, make sure it's a Winston. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I've, I've enjoyed the heck out of my Winstons that I have. So they are they are wonderful, wonderful, fun rods to play with. What's but. your favorite Winston that you own, Spencer? Oh, shoot. Oh, goodness. Man, probably my B3X, my 9.5 B3X. Yep. And I've got a lot of really fun ones, but that 9... Well, actually, no, I take it back. My 8.5, 6 weight pre-IM6. Yeah. That's a cool Take rod. it back. That's a sweet rod. That, that, I don't fish it as much because I, I don't want to break it. Uh, but that, that B3X, though, is wonderful. And I love that little B3X of mine. But, totally. Yeah, they're good. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your time today, guys. Thank you so much for being willing to sit down and oh, yeah. talk shop for a little bit. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. And having yeah. us on. So. Well, thanks for letting us invade Twin Bridges for a little bit. We upped the population a bit coming in today. but Yep. 402. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a noticeable bump. There'll be a news article about it tomorrow. Oh, you know, I expect there to be. When Untangled comes to town, Dad Gummit, people better take note. Frontline of the Madisonian. <laughs> oh, well, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank yeah. you, guys. Yep.